So um, one of the things that uh, when Amy and, and Isaac Lurie and everyone from J Street asked me to, to speak about was um, American Jewry in the age of Obama as we all find ourselves you know, living in and probably I think it's safe to assume for everyone here enjoying. Um, so I'll just make a, a couple points. Um, we can you know, go around and talk about whatever and, and then go back to drinking in a, a less formal setting. Um, so first, um, about uh, a year and a couple months ago, uh, when Obama was running for president, before it looked like a sure thing that he was going to win the Democratic nomination, I wrote uh, a piece for the American Prospect about just what an Obama foreign policy might look like. And I spent um, a couple weeks talking with the people who would end up being um, more or less the Obama uh, White House National Security Council and um, eventually, you know, Susan Rice, the UN ambassador, and, and a couple other people. And a point that they all wanted to make was not a policy point. A, a point that they wanted to make was that the ways in which Obama would conceive of foreign policy would, would take America outside the boundaries of, of a debate that they considered you know, pretty stale, and something that I think progressives also considered very stale. And a point that they repeated again and again and again was that when discussing America's role on the world stage, it was time to end the politics of fear, as they called it. And what this meant, you know, in their earlier conceptions of it, would be, you know, making points that they found intuitively correct that were simply just not represented in the current discussion. And this meant things like saying, you know, we believe that 30 years of isolating, containing, and sanctioning Iran hadn't led to any kind of moderation in Iranian foreign policy. And if the idea is we're going to bring about results in terms of American security and security for our friends and allies in the region, we shouldn't be afraid to take other steps. And that would include things like direct diplomacy. And you know, I think it's, it's either too early or you know, fair enough to say at this point that we're still waiting on some of the results of what this means. But I kind of think, you know, watching American foreign policy develop over the, couple, the last couple months, that one place that they really, you know, met this and cashed this out, you know, very strongly has been on, on Israel and, and on peace. And, you know, one of the most amazing things to see as the administration was staffing up was to see, you know, someone like Abe Foxman, you know, describe George Mitchell when it came to the appointment of Mitchell um, to be, you know, Obama's envoy for peace as too even-handed. And, you know, a lot of people in this room, like, understand what that's code to mean. And I had some people on my blog just, you know, ask me who, who didn't really understand the intricacies of, of, you know, what, for lack of a better term, we should call shtetl politics. You know, what, what, what's wrong with being even-handed? You know, how could someone find the proposition that one should listen and adjudicate between the discussions and debates and desires of the Israeli and the Palestinian community is problematic. You know, what's, what's the matter with that? And I had to find myself saying, well, there's all this, you know, fraught, you know, angst and spilkes in, in our communities about, like, the reasons why you shouldn't be even-handed, even though we would say outwardly that you shouldn't. And I just found, you know, even, you know, someone who would think that this is nonsense still finds themselves kind of trapped in, in euphemism, trapped in an inability to explain clearly why something like that is just unambiguously a good thing. And the next proposition that, that would come to mind would be, well, why should it be trapped in euphemism? And the reason why is because there's a crisis of confidence among people, I think, of a generation older than we are in the American Jewish community that the American-Israeli bond won't last if we talk frankly and honestly about what it means to support Israel, what it means um, to have disagreements with Israel, and what it means to support peace in the region, what it means to support the birth of a two-state solution. And that's more problematic and fear-laden than nearly anything I could think of from the perspective both of Israel and of, and of American foreign policy. And it, it you know, is a bit of a cliche. I think it was, it was Martin Amos who called euphemism a mortal sin for writers and for thinkers because, you know, at any time you, you find yourself unable to express your thoughts clearly, you should find yourself, you know, asking why that is. And if there is a crisis of confidence among an older generation 
for what it means to support Israel if we can't speak honestly about the problems with Israeli foreign policy, with Israeli policy towards the Palestinians, then we shouldn't shy away from that. What we should talk about is how, as supporters of Israel, and particularly as American supporters of Israel, and particularly as American Jewish supporters of Israel, who have you know, closer ties emotionally and culturally um, to Israel than anyone else, how it's incumbent upon us, and particularly as progressives in that community, to make sure that that policy changes, and changes in such a way that it recognizes that the bonds between American and Israel and the bonds between American Jews and Israeli Jews are strengthened and not harmed by a frank conversation and similarly strengthened and not harmed by the prospect that we recognize that so much of what it means to be Jewish, what it means culturally to be Jewish and what it means to be you know, a vocal part of a progressive American Jewish community is to talk about justice and to talk about an injustice that's been visited by Israeli Jews on Palestinians for 40 years. And if we don't do that, we're compromising Israeli security in ways that are probably familiar to you know, everyone in this room, so I won't belabor the point. Um, and we're compromising um, an American mission and American security on the world stage. And what's been amazing to see about, about J Street and about you know, the people who, who've come around today is that there is a recognition on the part, I think of a younger generation, I think of a younger progressive generation, to say that we're not going to tolerate that. We're not going to tolerate a debate that exists within a very constrained and a very fearful context. And that's not to say that progressive Jews have a monopoly on wisdom, because we don't. And it's not to say that there is one conception of what it means to support Israel and what it means to have a sane foreign policy, because you know, there isn't. What it does mean is that there ought to be a voice and there ought to be um, a counterbalance to a, a debate that for so long has been monopolized by those who say there actually is one way. And it's been, I think objectively speaking, a fairly right-wing way. And particularly one that unfortunately has kind of grown up and existed um, within the American Jewish community. And it's very refreshing um, at this moment in time to be able to say that there is an organization like J Street that's coming up right now specifically to challenge this notion and to broaden it on progressive terms. And you know, we can have you know, internal debates and criticism about these sort of things, and it doesn't impact what it means to support Israel. It's been amazing to see the commentary over the last several months that tries to write the people in this room out of the community that supports Israel. And, you know, it's on the one hand, you know, disgusting and, and, and angering, but on the other hand, you know, I, you know, I pity these people. I pity people who think that a deeper and broader discussion of what it means to support Israel is somehow either problematic or dangerous or destructive because ultimately what they're doing is they're short selling the ways in which America feels so close to Israel and, and they're demonstrating that they don't have confidence in this proposition. And that's a misunderstanding of America. It's a misunderstanding of what Israel represents in America. And I would, leave, you know, I would end it on, on one point which is I, I got in a conversation with, with a bunch of, of fairly right-wing friends a couple of years ago. Um, it, was, it was during um, the withdrawal from Gaza, and it was, you know, it was continuing, especially through the Lebanon war, in which you know, nothing that didn't in lockstep support you know, a particular conception of that withdrawal and then a particular conception you know, of that war, which I think was a, you know, ex exposed a disaster in uh, disastrous lack of an Israeli strategic thinking. Um, and, and I was just confronted with this argument that, you know, ultimately we should divide the American Jewish community and we should divide foreign policy thinking into a conception of supporting Israel that leaves out the prospect of criticizing um, this, this very large and very vocal you know, community of criticism. And it just struck me that that's the surest way um, over the coming generations to ensure that ultimately America won't support Israel. That if we decide further and further to slice the salami so that um, a very extreme conception of what it means to be pro-Israel is the definition of what it means to be pro-Israel, then ultimately what we're doing is we're ensuring that America will support Israel less and less. And I have a very hard time with that proposition for a variety of reasons. And after that, I think I'll close on that note. And if anyone wants to talk about anything, let's have drinks and talk. <laughs>